this week on an all new episode of Tomboy T Rod. Team T Rod finds themselves in the aftermath of post apocalyptic war, where an atomic war has devastated the humanity and whitewashed out the entire world. A new empire has arisen. And it is now one that discriminates against all color except white. Wait, is white even a color? So where does that leave people who want color in their lives? It's time for us to take it to the streets. That's it. Are we ready to do this? I'm all for it. Bring it on. Wait. Oh, what now? There we go again. Someone has to be the adult around here. Is this really necessary? Well, we have to take a stand against this whitewashed-out empire. Ever since those rouge stormtroopers took over this world by dropping their atomic bomb and established a brand new order that discriminates against any other color, we all can't see shit except white color everywhere. And I tell you, it's too bright till I have to wear shades because it hurts my eyes. Hell yeah, we got to bring color back. After all, we are the funny woman of tomboy T Rod, Asia's biggest and only all-female comedy chat podcast. Not tirade or T Rod, but T Rod, the way we like to say it. And I have a getaway car just around the corner. Ah, that's more like it. Okay, guys, on my mark. In three, two, one. This is fun. It's my first time ever spraying illegal gravity on the wall. I mean, like one of the bucket list, man. Crap! We have to run. Go, go, go! Oh no! Go! He forgot to pump petrol. Well, I kind of run out of money after getting us a spray. I mean, this contraband stuff is some expensive shit, yo. I don't want to end a white wash. I'm liking myself as it is. Don't be silly. That's the resistance. Don't you guys recognize the Millennium Falcon? Come on board this ship right now if you want to live. Um, that does not sound like Han Solo in any way. Who cares? I'm getting on this ship, Falcon Eagle, or whatever it is. Oh, wait, 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 Great. Hang on tight, tomboys. Asia's biggest and only all-female English comedy chat podcast. Welcome to Tomboy T Rod. you fools doing? We were rebelling. We are rebelling against the whitewash order, can't you see? By spraying graffiti on the walls. How is that going to make any difference? Oh my god. It's Desiree Birch who saved our asses, guys. Thanks, Desiree. I mean, do you know that when she is not busy being a rebel commander, I mean, Desiree Birch is a comedian, actor, writer, and storyteller. And she was raised in LA developed artistically in New York and recently resides in London. I mean, where else have she not gone? 
And with a brash and energetic comedy style that has been on NBC and E4 and made her the winner for the 2015 Funny Women's Stage Award for Stand Up. How can you ladies not know this? As a writer and a performer, she makes raw and gutsy work. Her critically acclaimed solo show, 52 Man Pickup, has two internationally, and her solo piece, Tar Baby, won the 2015 Fringe First for new writing at the Edinburgh International Festival Fringe. So what are you guys waiting for? Check out her website at www.desiriebirch.com or you can follow her on Twitter at DesTheRay, D-E-S-T-H-E-R-A-Y. Welcome, hey, welcome to thank you. Ooh, yeah, awesome. <laughs> so you were raised in LA. Yeah. You developed in New York. I'm actually back in New York right now. Um, life has brought me back. Uh, and I'm here um, doing some shows, working on uh, writing a stand-up piece for uh, Edinburgh this mm-hmm. summer, and also renewing my visa for the UK so I can go back for another year. You have to renew your visa. Ah, logistics. Uh. Yes, yes, yes. That is the uh, logistics of uh, trying to be a citizen of the world, is that the world has borders all over the place that you constantly have to negotiate with. Um, So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I get to, uh, I'm fortunate to be able to get to be in the, the UK as a performer because of, you know, visas for performers and things, but it does mean I need to check in with them every year to make sure it's still cool. And like, you know, I have paid like my taxes there and like haven't committed any crimes or whatever. I think the most important thing is they probably want to know your taxes. Like, yeah, it's time to pay back. Yeah, of course. They like, yes, we don't really care about the crimes. Just, just pay us. <laughs> And then why did you move to the UK yeah. from New York? I, uh, well, this is like one of the least tomboy things I could say. I moved uh, to be with my boyfriend. <laughs> oh, <laughs> nice. Oh, <man. laughs> Love is in the air. Sweet. Yeah. You got to do it once in your life just to see what happens. Um, but I, uh, <laughs> um, unfortunately, the guy lived in London and not like somewhere in Nebraska or something. No diss on Nebraska, but, uh, you know, it's. Lame. Uh, so, uh, yeah, essentially I'd, uh, you know, gone to, uh, you know, a couple of fringe festivals and I had met him, uh, you know, in like 2011 and, um, reconnected a little bit later and, and we were long distance for a bit, but I, you know, was basically like, why not? You know, it's, uh, it's London, like, you know, it's a fantastic city and it might be great to also perform there since I've been, you know, ha- dipping my toe into doing stuff at, uh, the fringe and in the UK. And, uh, so I moved like, uh, a year and a half ago, I guess, and uh, it's been wonderful. Um, I really dig it. So, yeah, it's nice to be super international and be like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to be in New York for a few weeks and then back to London, and everyone's like, wow, um, because, like, I'm able to get on planes or something. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Are there big differences between the scenes in the States and the scenes in uh, in the UK? I mean, there are some, for me, noticeable differences. The, I would say, like, as far as, you know, I was in New York for 13 or so years, you know, and, uh, you know, I, I'm also, you know, an actor, a solo performer, a writer, do a bunch of different things. So there are all these different artistic communities. Um, a lot of them bleed together a lot more in New York specifically because, like, lots of people here do several things. Um, I feel like people maybe specialize a little bit more uh, t- uh, from what I can see in the, uh, yeah, in the UK. And it's like, oh, comics are over here and actors over here and burlesque performers there or what have you. Um, But uh, on the same token, I think that uh, I like the support in the comedy scene in the UK maybe a little bit more. I feel like people are, are a little bit more chill and everybody's like, yeah, we're all just here doing a job and we all do different things and it doesn't necessarily feel as competitive as it does in New York because I think everyone in the comedy scene here in New York would love to just be like on a sitcom or be writing, you know, for TV or some other thing and they're always trying to get like the next thing based on what they're doing and so it feels like for some reason 
reason, like, we're all competing for what, like, these magical spots that supposedly exist for us, you know, um, as opposed to people kind of being like, yeah, you know, like, I tell jokes and uh, that's my job. And also, you get paid in the UK, whereas in New York, it's really hard to get to a place to get paid. And so I oh, I think, wow. yeah, I mean, that's a thing. It's like the city really feeds on the energy that we are giving it, you know, and it doesn't really give you any compensation for that. Like it never gives you a chance to go like, oh, I did it or I achieved something or I get a chance to rest. It's like, yeah, you're doing a lot of really cool shows, but you're lucky to get paid at most of them. Most of them are like, here's a drink ticket. Like, thanks, you know, and it's about you just getting better. But I think that at a certain point, you're kind of like, I've been doing this for X amount of time. Like, I don't know how much better I'm supposed to get before I can start calling this something like a career. Um, and in London, that's just not so. You know, I mean, there's just, you know, gigs all over the UK. And, the, you know, they're like, OK, we have a bar. Obviously, their ticket prices, people are paying money. Here's your cut. And it's mm. nice. It feels like a job. Right. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I get what you mean. We were just talking to, I think, another comedi- a female comedian did recently uh, based in India where she gets paid with uh, drinks, food and drinks from the bar or something like that. And yeah, it, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean by it, it's nice to get paid for doing, especially what you love, you know I mean? Like yeah. telling, making people laugh is a job. Yeah. After you've done it for a while, you're like, this is a job. Like this is my work. And like, I don't want to be paid in alcoholism. Do you know what I mean? Like <laughs> I can't pay my bills with that. What is the resistance doing to defeat the empire? Well, uh, apart from fighting them, we are using the power of storytelling to win over the hearts and minds of listeners. Right, sure. Kind of sounds a bit wishy-washy to me. (laughs) Okay, sure, all right. Persis, storytelling is a powerful tool to bring about change. That's just true. Yeah, fine, whatever. That sounds awesome. Don't be rude. She just saved our lives. Yeah. Oh, look, there are a few news highlights coming up on the screen here. Let's discuss some of the hottest trending topics of the day. An economics professor at the University of Pennsylvania, originally from Italy, was just scribbling down math equations on a piece of paper while waiting for his American Airlines flight to take off, but the passenger next to him thought he was up to no good. The woman sitting next to Guido Menzio alerted a flight attendant that she was sick after the plane, American Eagle Flight 3950, was delayed on the tarmac for nearly 30 minutes Thursday. Menzio was removed from the aircraft by a pilot along with his fake ill neighbor. Menzio 40 told the paper that he felt he was treated respectfully, but added that the broken system does not collect information efficiently. After showing them that he was just writing notes for a paper, he was allowed back on the plane, but the unidentified woman did not return. First up, we have an Italian Ivy League economist on an American airline flight from Philadelphia being flagged by a passenger to the crew as being a possible Middle Eastern terrorist. <gasps> and guess what? <laughs> the threatening notes he was scribbling down turned out to be mad. Huh? <laughs> Ooh. Yes, that's right. Who knew that math could be dangerous? Oh, maybe, you know, he's a member of the new algebra cell with algorithm as their supreme mm-hmm. leader. Yes. <laughs> I mean, leave it to an American passenger to be freaked out by math. Like, <laughs> I don't understand. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> That's understandable. Oh, my God, math. <laughs> Ooh, burn. <laughs> well, he has a beer and he's working on math, right? These two things combined together would be scary to Americans. Well, yeah, exactly. Ambiguously brown person making, uh, you know, sense. I, yeah. <laughs> like, no, not in my country, not on my plane. I actually look at a photo of him, but he looks like, he doesn't even look like 
white meat it is or anything to me. He looks like a white guy, but she's Ital- he's Italian, so he's a bit tan. Maybe <laughs> maybe too much sun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so from math we move to Hollywood. Hollywood has a long luxurious history of casting white people for Asian characters. Last month, Margaret Chu, Constance Wu, along with several other Asian creators, joined and led a discussion on Twitter calling upon the Hollywood decision makers who refuse to cast actors of color in more high-profile roles. The discussions hashtag whitewashed out trended nationwide on Twitter as people shared their thoughts on the erasure of Asian Americans from whitewashed movies and how that tickles down to the society at large. Scott Derrickson is in the hot seat lately for being the director behind Doctor Strange, whose film has upset the Asian community by changing, God forbid, the Ancient One character from a horrible Asian stereotype to a Celtic woman played by Tilda Swinton. What an upgrade. He tweeted this in response to the campaign, Raw Anger Hurt! from Asian Americans over Hollywood whitewashing stereotyping and erasure of Asians in cinema. I am listening and learning. Do you guys think that hashtag Oscars so white and hashtag whitewashed out movements will actually change attitudes and push for diversity in Hollywood? Over to you, well, I mean, I, Yeah, right. <laughs> sure, I'll take that one. Um, I, you know, I don't know that those things alone are going to change anything. I definitely think that awareness is the beginning of any kind of change. So uh, the fact that people can kind of create that in a like an instantaneous way through social media is very helpful because I do think that people. I think that most people in Hollywood are really scared because they have a lot of money invested into what they think people want. Um, and they make choices based on that, which are sort of based on their own uh, prejudices and what they've seen before. So they're always sort of looking back at the past and trying to, you know, build from that. And as opposed to doing anything that might be visionary or new or uh, taking a risk. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that everybody just sort of like, let's do the most like conservative thing possible and hope we can get away with it, you know, (laughs) and make all of our money back and then some. Um, But, you know, like, I think ultimately it's definitely got to go beyond hashtags, you know, to get there. But I do think that that um, because Hollywood is such a fickle sort of uh, completely dependent on the whim of, uh, you know, culture um, kind of, uh, you know, industry that when culture is kind of like, yeah, this sucks. I mean, I think obviously the next step, which never like works anymore, is to like be like, oh, well, like, don't go and pay to see these films or whatever but because people are always going to do that like they don't really care to really put their money where their mouth is in terms of stuff and you know (laughs) yeah i mean i get what you mean why they don't boycott and totally like not show up or don't go for the movies they will still show up because they'll be curious to see for example in this case how tilda sweeten acts as that character because there's so much um, news and you know highlights of headlines about it and everybody's talking about it so instead of like okay I shall not watch it in, to show my support it's more of like yeah, ah, I'm curious now how is she going to act in this role people are going to go and check it out <laughs> so it doesn't matter who they yeah. offend because ultimately like there's no bad press you know so uh, there's got to be some like other way to undermine oh that God. you know how can you get everyone to just ignore something you know what I mean especially if you tell them to ignore it it's like the last thing they're going to do yeah it's like oh okay you tell me to ignore okay all the more I should go and see it because I really want to know what what is, is making everyone upset? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to her credit, Tilda is a very is an actress I respect her very much. But if she's also a Celtic woman, then why does she, they have to do the yellow face? I will be so offended if they don't try to make her look Asian. Why can't she keep her her skin color and what her hairstyle and everything? Why must she turn into some alien looking thing? They made her bald, isn't it? Yeah, I was about to say they made her bald right there. I mean, not bald, but I think she had to wear like. <laughs> Yeah, some rubber thingy on <laughs> to make sure that you can see her hair. It, she just looked like a weird <laughs> shaped alien walking around wearing that costume. I'm sorry, that's what I thought. I was like, I guess they're like, well, we can't make her Asian, so we'll just make her like completely alien, and then nobody can be upset because we don't have alien prejudice yet. 
<laughs> wow. <laughs> Hollywood is so offending like three quarters of tomboy tea right right now. <laughs> the resistance like now please okay you guys do have to prove that you're worthy and can contribute to the cause well I can tell a story there's no problem you know being a storyteller and all that and I'm an engineer what since when do you like drop out of your engineering degree that I do not know of I mean like what playing the Star Wars Battlefront or Xbox One does not count okay I've been following Star Wars franchise since I was in diapers. And I've seen how Ray pilots the Millennial Falcon at nauseum in A New Hope. How hard could that be flying a plane? Uh, what are you guys whispering about? Mm, forget about those two. They're always scrabbling among themselves. So, tell me, what is it like winning the 2015 Funny Women Awards for stand-up? Can you tell us more about the awards? And in first place, this year's winner of the 2015 Funny Women Awards is the fantastic... Desiree Birch. A little place I can put this big guy. Um, but yeah, um, it, it was fantastic. And I'm so excited that Funny Women exists. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, well, first of all, it uh, was super fantastic. Uh, Funny Women is a great, yeah, it was, and I'm like, yay, winning things. Like, that yeah. never happens. It's yay. awesome. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it was like, there was a cash prize. I got some makeup from their sponsor, like, you know, and some press, and it was cool. Um, I paid the rent. It was awesome. <laughs> That's like comics being overjoyed. Like, woohoo, knock that rent out. Yeah, I mean, they, basically organized by a wonderful group of women who work with uh, Benefit as their sponsor and they um, you know essentially not only do they have this awards uh, that they do every year for a uh, female comedy talent but they also do all kinds of like workshops and you know like improv and stamp, stand up and, and um, you know sketch and, and screenwriting and all of these different things and they really seek to provide a network for women to kind of get ahead in uh, all aspects aspects of comedy, which, I mean, ultimately in a business like this, it really is about, you know, like who, you know, if they like you, if you can get the right meeting. Um, and, uh, so, you know, in order to sort of turn the table, so comedy isn't such a boys club, you not only have to sort of cultivate the talent or find the talent, but like help them to be better represented and better represent themselves and to help them be better connected. So I feel like funny women really do a great job of, of, you know, uh, bringing people together and like it's a really great group of smart supportive women who are really talented so um, that's awesome I feel like it maybe in the future shouldn't have to exist but for the time that it does I think it's doing really great work you know yeah funny women unite woot woot <laughs> the women for women yep yep <laughs> and take over <laughs> it work like do they come and watch you perform or do you have to like it's like a bet- battle royale oh my gosh you basically do a initial sort of like qualifying heat you know where you basically like you know they've got like 10 female comics up and between I think that they did an audience vote counted for a percentage of it and then they had judges there who were voting for the first one and then from there like a couple of people advance and then you go to a semifinals where like everyone's just like a little bit funnier and keener and then you know if you get beyond that then you advance to the actual final which is a show and they've got like you know industry uh, judges there or what not to decide like who you know wins and what not this is like fight club for funny women man it's yeah like a little club bit but hey women. I mean that's kind of comedy in a nutshell it is a little bit about like fight club you know yeah it's like funny woman the survivor <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that's where a lot of humor comes from is people who have, like, survived shit, (laughs) you know, and, you know, talk about it. Can you tell us more about Ta Baby and what is your experience performing it? Now, I don't want to do a show about race, okay? 
you don't want to see a show about race, all right? I mean, you do want to say that you saw a very important show about race and, hey, I am no fool, all right? I am no ignoramus, okay? I saw Do the Right Thing twice and that Chris Rock movie about hair, okay? I know about black people, all right? When you watch it. Sure. So, um, Tar Baby, uh, is, uh, well, it was the solo show that I took to last year's Fringe that, uh, won the Fringe first, and it's all about, uh, race and capitalism in America. Um, so, you know, essentially it was about, um, I don't know, the interplay of those two things and how one doesn't really exist without the other, at least not in this country, you know, how one sort of begets the other. And, um, uh, yeah, I took that to the fringe last year. I'd done it, uh, you know, like in New York a bit before. And, um, since then, um, have got a chance to do it in London and in New Zealand and we'll go to Finland with it, which will be fun. And hopefully to take it to some other places, ideally we'll tour around the U S a bit more. We're in talks about how to do that since it very much is sort of about racism in the, the United States. But I think that there is there's definitely, uh, you know, like, af there are definitely aspects of it that exist everywhere. Um, yeah, but it's funny. So it was like a done as a carnival and all of the different games were like, you know, involved the audience and were different aspects of, you know, being like a black female or, you know, just, uh, like there's a game that we play called let's beat the shit out of racism. <laughs> I would love to see you perform this live, but let me be the first to tell you that with that, you cannot come to Singapore. Oh. With that said, they will not allow you to perform it anywhere in Singapore. That is sad, but so true. Yeah. What is it about that? That is so not for Singapore. Like what are the sort of cultural rules or, you know, theatrical rules? I don't know. I think it's more of like the fact that the whole thing is about race and government and everything. It's just... Oh, yeah. They're just like, nope, sorry. <laughs> I mean, how would your how did your audience react to, I mean, when you talk about like race and tar babies? It, I mean, you brought it to like US and UK and then you brought it to New Zealand. Were there like differences between all these audience and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, I mean, the show very much depends on the audience and sort of takes on a different, uh, you know, tone, uh, depending on where it's performed. And, um, I think like, I've been pleasantly sort of surprised everywhere I've gone with the show in terms of like the people who relate to it, because ultimately, you know, there are lots of, there are lots of people who, you know, uh, for whatever reasons, uh, are different and are on the outside in some reason, you know, there, are, there are people who are, uh, you know, mm -hmm. gay or there are people who are, you know, like overweight or there are people who are of a different race that isn't necessarily black or people who are disabled or just women in general who feel like they sit on the outside of what is uh, sort of privilege or, you know, especially in, you know, like places like uh, the U.S. and even the U.K. is like that is what is touted as like the mainstream, you know, is like, oh, yeah, we're all like, you know, middle class and like, you know, can afford to have lattes every day and dye our hair blonde <laughs> and all of these things. And that's not everyone's experience. So I think that lots of people um, connected to that, like specifically uh, with like like race and gender in the States. And I think, uh, with class in the UK, um, you know, I think a lot of, there are a lot of like, you know, surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, cause like white people totally get it too, but there are a lot more white people who are like all like, yeah, about the show, you know, because they, you know, have that economic, uh, feeling of outsiderness that they identify with that they don't necessarily have the privilege that it looks like they have. Um, so, um, and yeah, in New Zealand, I mean, it went off like, rockets like people really dug it I mean especially because they have such a, a strong you know um, like you know culture of Maori and Samoan people there you know who basically are the black people of New Zealand you know because like every country's got its version basically of like yeah. oh and these people True. you know um, and like no matter what it's just like there's a lighter version and there's a darker version and like the darker version can go you know fly off a cliff basically um <laughs> In Singapore context, well, in American context, I'm Latina. <laughs> oh, wow. That's amazing. That's awesome. <laughs> So, 
since Hollywood can't seem to get their casting right, I propose we should show them how exactly it should be done. So we are going to play a casting game right now, and we have Desiree versus Team Tom YT Rat. Yeah, and I'm just gonna ask a few good questions, and we'll see who has the best answers. After the blackface controversy, the Nina Simone biopic was released recently with barely a whimper. They actually went straight to video. So if you were to recast the lead actress, who would you guys recast, and why? Wow. <laughs> Gosh. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like in the Nina Simone role, I mean. Uh, You'd have to get somebody younger if you wanted to do the whole biopic, because like my first go-to would be someone like um, Viola Davis from you know How to Make a Murder and The Help and a bunch of other stuff. Um, she just is amazing in everything, uh, but you know is more Nina Simone um, in her sort of later, more militant years. You'd have to get like somebody else to be her, you know, when she's like growing up and like playing piano, you know, in the South or whatever. <laughs> Tomboy T-Rat? I'll ask Stitty to answer this question because I know too few actresses I don't really know. I wouldn't mind it being Jennifer Hudson just because, Uh, you know, she has played Dream Girls before. I mean, she can sing live. I mean, as much as she has to mimic how how Nina Simone sings because I think Nina Simone is more husky, low, bluesy kind Mm -hmm. of feel compared to how Jennifer likes to, you know, blare it out and throw it out there. But... I mean, it'd be interesting to see if Jennifer Hudson does Nina Simone and then gives her, you know. And she has won awards for everything. Yeah. She's the only one yeah, with a Tony, right. with an Oscar, with an Emmy. Yeah. You know? So it'll be great to have her instead of, you know, it going to DVD, which is sad. So now we have to go buy the DVD. Okay, this is hard to decide because I actually like both answers. I think you guys have very good casting choices. I'll, ju- I'll just give half a point to each of you guys. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yay. All right. That's fair. That's very okay. fair. <laughs> <laughs> the next question is, what are the race stereotypes that you are tired of seeing in the movies? <laughs> <laughs> Go, Joanna. I hate to say that Chinese people are good at math, which is not true. We just were pushed really hard to study <laughs> math. We were small and like we were not born better. That I, I really hate it. Like we perpetuate the stereotype, meaning more kids will be forced to do math when they were small. Uh, so I, I don't want to see it anymore. <laughs> Let's see. I guess what is what stereotype? I don't know. In general. I'm like the, the sort of play at diversity when it's like, oh, like here is like this white star and here's their group of friends. And there's like a black one and then like uh, an Asian one. And like they're like, we did it. We did diversity. Yay. Like th- we totally hang out and like talk about all of our girls because it's like part of it is like, yeah, it'd be nice if everybody was like, you know, United Colors of Benetton and like every, the you know, <laughs> but like it seems unrealistic because like when you see in life is like, you know, people have, you know, a bunch of different kinds of friends or like they have a bunch of friends who look just like them or they, you know, like, I, like I am all for inclusion, but like when it's obvious, it, you know, like when it's like, oh, we're just going to have like a token, everybody here. And like, clearly this person's going to have like a really sassy, funny black friend. You're like a uh, snore, you know what I mean? Like that thing is just like, I'm like, I want to see the movie about the really funny, sassy black friend. Like, I don't want to see the movie about like your dumb romance or whatever, <laughs> you know? So <laughs> that's the one that I'm just kind of like, I don't know, like some part of me would be like, It'd be funnier if, like, the one white character had, like, only, like, you know... A few lines rather than the whole movie. Yeah, yeah, totally. That would be great. Or, like, maybe they're just like, I only have, like, you know, black male friends for whatever reason. Like, that would make me interested. I would just be like, okay, lady, why do you only hang out with, like, you know, whatever... (laughs) <laughs> guys from Harlem like what's up with you you know <laughs> like but just like the one of every shade like it's a crayon box it's like so obviously pandering to me you know hmm, this is hard I like Desiree answer but then as a Chinese I totally identify with <laughs> Joanna <Yeah. laughs> that, that will be, be me. me that will be me too I actually was surprised they actually offered me engineering cause I was like my mess is like a worst subject why do you offer me engineering <laughs> they, they saw your picture that's it <laughs> <laughs> And they're like, you're going to head our whole department. I wear space. I have short hair. I look like a geek. Yeah. That's messed up, but funny. Okay, I'll go with Joanna. I'll give uh, Team Tira one point. Woo! All right. Next question. So what do you guys think about a black James Bond? 
Oh, well, I mean, Idris Elba Ooh. could play the hell out of that role. Let's be real. Like, there isn't anything he couldn't do. Like, because he was the one they were considering for the Black I James so Bond. Agree. Um, and, I so sorry? agree. He's like sex on a stick. Sorry, I have a, I have a big crush on Idris yeah. Elba. He's so hot. He's excellent. Come on. Okay. There's like a black guy with a British accent is just like one of the sexier things on earth. <laughs> um, and <laughs> um, yeah, he totally could have played the hell out of that. And he's really smooth. Like, and I mean, he also seems to be like a bit of a player in his real life, at least from what the tabloids would say. So like, it seems like he has that, you know, like not in a negative way. It's just like, he's smooth. He's a smooth criminal, you know, like he could totally, he could totally play James Bond in a way that would be different and refreshing, honestly, you know, because I think everyone was like excited when Daniel Craig came on because he was a different kind Mm -hmm. of Bond. And I think if you want to reinvigorate that, get yourself a different kind of bond like it just looks great in a suit and in a sports car and like running with a gun like what what else does he need you know and he can act really well so you're yeah. sorted you i'm know? sorry i'm jumping on a desiree team here <laughs> I, i'm yeah. jumping from the top of yeah. Yeah. yeah two points two votes for yeah, Idris Elba. That, that was a missed opportunity that they didn't go with that because they didn't think people would be into a black james bond i think you don't know what people think is sexy. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta try <laughs> so i guess at the get the point yeah. the desert after arc is everybody's on the other side yeah <laughs> <laughs> Which makes everybody even. Okay, we'll have one last question. And hopefully this will break the stranglehold. So, here comes the final question. Who is the whitest of these two? Emma Stone as a Hawaiian or Joseph Fiennes as Michael Jackson? Oh, Joseph Fiennes. Joseph Fiennes. Sorry. Just, that's that's an easy one. I uh, to, to my mind. I mean, I get it. Michael Jackson was much lighter than when he started out by the time he ended, but like, what? Like, uh, what? I don't know. That one particularly made me mad because I've got MJ close to my heart. Um, I didn't know that Emma Stone was playing a Hawaiian. Uh, some Chinese in her. Opinion. Well, yeah, she, she was like half Hawaiian. So that's why everybody was like, what? Oh. This is this girl is not Asian. There's a little Asian. Or little At all. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of absurd and ridiculous. I mean, I guess they're trying to say, well, she's only half. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, they probably were going for that. But it could also mean that, you know, she got a tan. <laughs> yeah, they totally tanned her. I would agree with Desiree too, because that that image of Joseph Fiennes just trying too hard to be, do not destroy the memory of MJ. Hell no. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Just not. I mean, they didn't even try. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's not like there weren't some like... Uh, lighter skinned black actors like <laughs> they just didn't try like it's not like Joseph Fiennes look anything like Michael Jackson yeah <laughs> I mean I would have rather they gotten like a, a woman to play Michael Jackson who was who was brown you know than like Joseph Fiennes <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to do all those high pitches probably a girl who can do that <laughs> hmm, this is tough, but I think I like Desiree answer better because I would totally watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. I think we came up with a killer idea today, ladies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the winner is Desiree! Yay! Yay! <laughs> yeah, so after this recording, we'll just like, you know, go and make and produce the film. Looks like we have company here. We are being followed by two Imperial landing craft, and I'm gonna have to shake them off. So here we go. I think I'm going to be <coughs> seasick. Okay, most of the ship is down. This does not look good. Raven, since you are the engineer, uh, can you go down to the engine room and check the damage? You know what? I think that is a brilliant idea. Come on, guys, follow me. I need your help too. See you in the wild, Desiree. Good, yeah. Uh, I'm gonna steer us out of harm's way as best I can. Go, yeah, let's go, let's yeah. go. Yeah, keep going, Desiree. May the force be with you. May the force be with you. Are you sure you know what you're doing? Absolutely not. We'll just wing it as we go. Oh, no. May the force give us strength instead, because we 
Hell yes, ik vind dit. Het The light has gone off and I hear alarms ringing. Like, like, what should we do next? Maybe I should press that button over. No, 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 Raven, keep your hands off the console. Okay, okay, chill, Joanna. Guys, are you okay in there? Oh, uh, yes, 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 um, everything's good, you know, nothing to worry about. Just focus on losing those guys. We've got it all covered in the engine room. Roger and out. We have to do something. Luckily for us, I have downloaded the app for how to fly and fix the Millennium Falcon. Cool beans. That is hope for us all. Yay, Joanna. According to this app, we should be pressing this button. And pull this knob. And a little bit screw on that one. That's it. Let's see if it works. Phew! The alarms are gone. Everything looks stable. Finally! Good job, Joanna. Double thumbs up to you. But, but why are we going up and up? Ah, let me check. Oh no, this is for the 1977 version of the Millennium Falcon. To assess the 2016 version, I have to pay $14.99 for the upgrade. That's daylight robbery! Forget it, just pay up! I can't, there's no 3G here. I think we have been fixing the ship the wrong way. No. Stormtroopers, I'm the best damn pilot in this resistance. Why are those tomboys not back yet? And why am I losing power? What? What is happening here? On that droid over there. Do you see it? Tomboys, if you are still alive, I've ejected myself out of the ship and I'm heading back to Resistance Base. I still haven't quite forgiven you for ruining my ship, but I do like your spirit. So, I left you directions for you guys to join us at the base. Awesome! We can do cool stuff over there, like learn how to fly an X-Wing without crashing it. Oh, um, I, I can see the directions to the base on this virtual reality projection, but how are we going to get to that planet? We don't even have a car now, let alone a spacecraft. Looks like we have to hitchhike a space freighter somewhere. Well, because of that, folks, that's the end of another ridiculous episode of Tomboy T Rod. Thanks for listening. And if you've enjoyed this episode of Tomboy T Rod, don't forget to subscribe to the show on iTunes and Stitcher. The show is also available for free streaming on our website where you'll find Absolutely the most brilliant stuff on being a funny geek tomboy in space time today. Check it out at www.tomboy-tarts.com. It's all about a tomboy, y'all. That's right. And if you just want to connect with us outside of the show, we are also on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Tumblr. Just like Tomboy Tarts. And if you have any inquiries about advertising, collaborating, or appearing on this podcast or our blog, drop us an email at hello at tomboy-tarts.com. That's hello at tomboy-tarts.com. Because we are everywhere, guys. Everywhere. 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 Everywh
Okay, we'll see you again, listeners, in another two weeks with a brand new episode here with Percy's Raven City and myself, Joanna. Until then, ciao, ciao. ciao. Adios, 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 amigos. We are everywhere, 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 everywhere.